Yo, what's up guys? Back again for another um, fight predictions and breakdowns video. This week it's going to be uh, UFC Vegas 7. It's not the greatest card really in my opinion, but the main event, it's always fun to see a legend like Frankie Edgar compete. He's going to be fighting Pedro Munoz, who's, a, who's actually a pretty good fun action fighter. So that fight has potential there, but yeah, um, the rest of the card is, uh, you know, not that great. A lot of newcomers, a lot of people making their debuts, things like that, but there's some bright spots on the card, and we're going to break down the full card here. So, the first fight of the night, Timor Valley have taken on Mark Striegel. This is um, a, a good fight. It kind of got put together on short notice. Valiev, he was uh, supposed to make his UFC debut a couple weeks ago. Unfortunately, he couldn't get a visa. And um, I see from his social media that he's in Las Vegas already. So, this should be uh, good to go. He should be ready to fight this time. And... He put a six-fight win streak, uh, or he's coming in here with the six-fight win streak. He's a pretty good striker, uh, light on his feet, a lot of blitz attacks, throws a lot of kicks from the outside, inside-outside low kicks, round kicks. Very fast. He uh, closes his distance very quickly. He'll go to the body with uh, some straight punches, then upstairs with hooks. He is pretty good at slipping and rip ripping, and um, you know, good check left hooks as well. He'll pull counter. Throws a lot of spins, good flying, good flying knees. He'll throw also. He does play with his hands down though, and he uh, has gotten dropped in the past. He's gotten hurt with shots. Um, he has never been finished by strikes though, so that's good for him. Six knockouts himself, which is pretty good for a flyweight. And uh, he's a high level wrestler. Uh, real good level changes. He has, uh, you know, he sets it up well with the hands and the feints pretty well. He'll run through double legs. He has great takedowns in the clinch. Good trips. Good throws. And when he gets on top, he has good control. He likes to take the back, good front headlock position. He kind of uh, is good at creating scrambles, winning the scrambles, has great cardio, wears on guys. I've seen Valley have taken down a couple times, but his takedown defense is very good. His scrambling ability is elite. He's very hard to hold down. Fun style to watch. He's aggressive. He throws wild strikes. Good cardio. He's a flashy flashy guy even in the grappling you'll get slams throws things like that should be a good addition to the division here and he's going to be taking on mark striegel who's making his ut debut as well he has a shiny record 18 and 2 but his competition level has been questionable he has been some decent names like he does hold a victory over kai car of france but this will be the first fight for striegel in the united states since his ma debut and it's a weird time for striegel to get signed as well he hasn't fought since april of 2019 that fight in April of 2019 ended with a no contest due to a low blow. So he hasn't won in a while. But he's a grappler. He's a combat sambo champion. He did win the gold medal in the combat sambo 2019 Southeast Asia Games. His striking is not very good though. He's super low volume. His defense isn't the best. He kind of just waits for an opportunity to shoot in on the legs. He does throw some nice low kicks, good one-twos. Throw some heavy elbows. He's a, you know, a top-heavy, muscular, stiff guy, though. He can be countered. He enters kind of awkwardly at times. He isn't looking to finish you on the feet. No finishes on the feet, but he is a warrior, man. I mean, he could take damage. He doesn't get detoured, and uh, he's never been finished by strikes, but I have seen him hurt, put down by strikes. And he's a beast grappler, though. He has excellent timing on his level changes, good takedowns in the clinch on top. He's an aggressive passer, good submission artist. He likes side control. He'll get the crucifix position, look for arm locks, good scarf hold, good arm bar. He has a strong mount. When he gets to the back, he's dangerous, good rear naked chokes. He'll also jump on guillotines. I mean, he's a submission artist. He has 14 submissions and 18 wins. He has been submitted in both of his losses, but a lot of that has to do with him getting hurt and then getting submitted because he has great uh, submission defense. I mean, he does put himself in guillotines at times. And in his last fight, he got hurt, exhausted, got submitted with the rear naked choke. But that loss was to Reese, uh, or his last loss, not his last fight. But that loss was to Reese McLaren, who is a brown belt world champion. But his cardio is dirt is uh, questionable for Striegel. He has questionable cardio, and that has cost him in several fights. But you know, it's a, I think it's a closer fight than the line indicates. I don't really believe Teamer should be a minus five hundred here. I do think Striegel, if he can get him down, he could potentially cause him issues. But I got to go with Valiev here. Striegel has a chance in round one to get the submission. But after I, after that, I think Valiev will start owning him on the feet. Striegel doesn't check kicks. 
He's just very stiff. He doesn't set up his takedowns with strikes very well. Valiev should be able to see the takedowns coming. I think he will win via a decision or a, a late TKO victory. But my pick here is going to be Timur Valiev. In the second fight of the night, we got two more debutants here. But, but this is a good fight. It, it has potential to be a barn burner here. Carlton Minnis, he's making his UC debut here. He's um, coming in on short notice. He is replacing uh, injured Phil Rowe. But minus, he's 10-1. and one. His one loss came against a notable name in Rick Story. All of his wins are in Alaska FC, though, which I don't really like that promotion. It doesn't have uh, very stiff competition or good matchmaking. But he's undefeated at 10-0 and 0 in that organization. His one loss was in the PFL. But I will say, minus is a solid boxer. Good jab. He likes to throw the double jab 2 or 1-2-1. One, one. He'll throw some jab hooks, jab uppercuts. He has kind of a decisionator style. He'll stick with the jab, the two, use lateral movement, keep the distance, cruise to wins, not take a lot of risks. He, he kind of struggles with forward pressure, though. He's one-dimensional. He doesn't really throw a lot of kicks. When fighters can counter his jab or back him up, he struggles a little bit. Rick Story, he was able to pressure him, get inside, landed some big shots on him. Minus does have some finishes against low-level guys, though six knockouts. He's used to being the longer, lanky guy using the reach and the range game. And in this fight, he's actually going to be a couple inches shorter than his opponent. So I'm sure that's going to give him a little bit of trouble here. His grappling isn't the best. When he gets backed up to the fence, fighters can get in on his legs. And uh, his takedown defense just doesn't look very good. He's shown some decent get-ups against low-level guys. But in his matchup with Rick Story, Minus was taken down with ease. He was absolutely dominated on the mat. Story was able to take him down, control him, move to dominant positions, ultimately got the submission. Minus did show some heart in the first round. He survived a deep arm triangle, but he gave his back whenever he tried to stand up. He ultimately got submitted with the rear naked choke. He does have one rear naked choke himself. I would say his cardio isn't good, but I'm just not sure he's UFC level. He is getting this short notice opportunity here. Matthew Salemsberger, he's 6-2, and two, but he's a dangerous guy. He's making his debut here in the UFC as well, and um, he is coming coming in here on a three-fight win streak. He's a badass Muay Thai fighter, super explosive, huge short-range power, heavy low kicks, nice long straight punches, but he's much better as a counter-striker. When he goes first, he can be wild. He has some incredible speed, though, nasty pull counter-straights. In the clinch, he has some heavy elbows, big knees. Super dangerous when he can get you against the fence. He'll flurry with big hooks, hard knees, jump elbows. Or I mean, jump knees, elbows. His last fight, he landed a, a one-shot KO with an elbow. But he's wild and open himself. I feel as the rounds go on, his explosiveness does kind of go down a little bit. He becomes more hittable. But early on, he's a motherfucker, man. He has four career knockouts. And uh, he has been finished by strikes one time. His grappling looks average. He doesn't have great wrestling and doesn't look good off of his back he does look like he's getting better with his get-ups with the scrambles he'll attack some submissions off his back but hit you know hit, taking him down right now is the way to beat him he does have decent leg locks in his last fight he was able to stuff all of his opponents takedowns i don't think minus will be able to take him down or even try to uh semmelsberger has been submitted once in his career and he has one submission but I think this is a bad matchup for a guy like Carlton Minus. To me, Semmelsberger is a explosive guy who comes forward, hits hard. And if he gets on the inside, I think he's going to put Minus' lights out in devastating fashion. Minus likes to play the range game, be the taller guy, the longer guy. In this fight, Semmelsberger is taller. I don't know about the reach, but he's probably longer, faster, more explosive. I actually think Semmelsberger is going to come in here and get a first round knockout. Um, next year, we have... um. You know, a really interesting fight, actually. When I first looked at this fight, I thought I was going to be, you know, leaning really heavily towards one guy. And after watching the tape, I actually went the other way. So, I like those kind of fights. I'm usually correct when I kind of feel like one guy's going to win. I go back and watch it and I switch my pick. I usually am correct because, you know, it's unbiased. Obviously, I thought the other guy was, was going to win. And then, uh, after watching it, I organically switched. So, but... It's going to be George Gonzalez. He's making a UFC debut a little later after his opponent failed to make weight in July. He was scheduled to face Kenneth Berg, but now he's going to be taking on Ike Villanueva here. On the feet, Gonzalez is a wild man. He has huge power also. He loves to brawl. He has one-punch knockout power. 
He walks fighters down. He's explosive. He's athletic. He has some decent straight punch blitzes to close the distance. And when he can back fighters up against the cage, he's very dangerous with these wide hooks. He has a real short range power, but he'll kind of try to extend the hook and make it like a like a real looping shot so he can catch you as you're trying to exit. He's willing to get in pocket wars. He's a durable guy. He uh, opens up and just closes his distance very wild though. And uh, he tries to use a little bit of head movement, but just gets hit and he eats it and keeps coming. He's a very tough dude, but very hittable. Um, 12 first round knockouts though, and in his whole 20 fight U or MMA career, he's only been out of the first round one time. He's actually a decent grappler. He is a black belt in jiu-jitsu. He likes to get takedowns against the cage. I've seen him get some quick back takes and rear naked chokes, but in his fight with Nazruddin Nazrudinov, man, he looked terrible off his back in round two. He consistently gave his back. He ate huge ground upon. He looked exhausted after the first round, though. That was his only fight that made it out of the first. Nazrudinov eventually took his back, flattened him out, finished him with punches. And uh, that wasn't a good look. I mean, he kind of quit in that fight after he got tired. Um, he was getting taken down with the single leg very easily as well. In this fight, he's going to be finding another striker. Uh, so I don't think he's going to have to deal with the, the grappling necessarily. But Ike Villanueva, he was making his second UFC appearance. He's hoping for a better result here. He did look pretty bad in his debut, losing to Chase Sherman. That fight was up a weight class at heavyweight, though. Now he's back at 205. This is his uh, normal weight class. He should perform better. As a fighter, I'm not super impressed with him, though. He does have good hands. Um, his left hook is good. He likes to use forward pressure. He backs fighters to the cage. Those combinations. He'll attack the body. He has good counter punching. Powerful straight right hand. Fast counter hooks in the pocket. He does look like he has some power. In his last fight, he was just undersized. Kind of got walked down, dominated. Now back at 205, I expect him to do better here. He does have 13 knockouts and 16 wins. He's been finished three times himself, but he has a good chin. And he's not much of a grappler. He does look to close the distance control. Opponents gets a clincher against, uh, or in the clinch against the fence a little bit. But he really doesn't do much damage or offense in those positions. Doesn't really look for takedowns. I have seen him hit some body locks uh, off the cage against some real low-level competition. Um... When he gets to top position, he is aggressive with his ground and pound. He'll try to finish the fight. But overall, he's just a boxer. He can be taken down, and when he gets taken down, he isn't good off of his back. Five submission losses. He's never earned a submission himself, but he's a dangerous guy. Like I said, uh, all 13 of his finishes are in the first round. So these guys uh, are going to come in, probably end it in the first round, man. And his cardio is questionable. Um, after round one, he's three and six. But I would say he does have more heart than a guy like George Gonzalez, just from what I've seen. In this fight, I'm going to go with Ike Villanueva on the feet. I think he has the much better technique, the faster hands, good counter punching. He obviously has to respect the power of a guy like uh, George, but if George comes in super wild, I could see Villanueva putting his lights out. If Ike uses his superior boxing and movement, forces uh, George to lead and counter punches, he should get him out of there. He just can't trade or do so do something stupid, get caught. I don't think George has the wrestling to take him down, so I don't really think he's going to try to do that. I'm going to pick Ike here via first round knockout. This next fight is a good fight. It was already scheduled one time um, in June, but Sele Selecki actually got COVID. He was forced to pull out of the fight. And... Um, in Selecki's first fight in the UFC, he dominated Matt Wyman. He looks good, so he's he's looking to gain some momentum here, get a foothold, try to get closer to that top 15. And on the feed, he's still very much developing, though. He's a good athlete, decent fake, fluid movement. He will throw some hard low kicks. He has a nice lead left. He will throw a left hook to the body. When he throws hooks in the pocket, though, his chin is straight in the air. His striking is very green, and overall, he, he just doesn't do a lot. He doesn't throw a lot of volume. A lot of circling and waiting on the feet. He is a smart fighter. He knows his strengths and he's just waiting for a time to time a takedown. He has one career knockout via strikes and he was knocked out in a fight in 2018. But Selecki is a grinder. He's a black belt in Jiu Jitsu. He's a solid wrestler. He does a good job of throwing some punches as a distraction, ducking under for doubles. He will time doubles when you throw kicks or he, he catches kicks well and takes you down as well. In his last fight, I will say he didn't really set up his takedowns with his strikes very well. Matt Wyman, I mean, he was completely square, 
throwing these super slow uh, kicks and you know he had a very easy time taking him down but against a better opponent he needs to set the shots up better once the lucky gets on top he is very heavy he's methodical throw some hard ground and pound and he's good at just taking what his opponents give him he'll just beat up on guys from inside their full guard if they don't want to open their legs when he can pass he'll look to move to side control trap wrists rain down punches he'll hunt arm triangles he has a good uh back take and Rooney could choke and he is excellent at finding ways to get his hooks in controlling the back position he has um you know real good back takes in the scrambles he does a good job flattening guys out finishing them He'll look to set up uh, guillotines from the back as well, arm bars. And um, in Selecki's last fight, he did dominate Matt Wyman on top. He almost submitted him uh, in, in multiple rounds and looked good. He does have four rear naked choke victories, six submissions overall. He went three rounds pretty hard in his last fight, but really had to fight through no adversity. So it's hard to tell if his cardio is really there 100%. But Austin Hubbard, he cashed in as a big underdog in his last fight. And... Um, it was one of the higher profile fights of the year, but not really due to Hubbard. You know, his opponent, Max Roshkoff, quit on the stool. It sparked a lot of controversy, backlash, and all credit to Hubbard, though, who dominated the fight. He got his name a little bit out there because of that. He has been up and down in the UFC, but if he can win here, it would really give him some momentum. He has been matched up with these beast grapplers in the UFC, man. I mean, he's already fought Jiu-Jitsu World Champion Davi Hamosh. He's fought an Olympic wrestler in Mark Madsen. And then he took on an elite uh, wrestler jiu-jitsu blend fighter in Max Roshkoff. So now he's getting another jiu-jitsu fighter in Joe Selecki. He should be used to this by now. And he's fought much stiffer competition than Selecki has. He's training at team elevation. Um, you know, he, he has a, the advantages in terms of that. He has a better camp. He's seen this look before. He's fought a lot higher level guys. And he's a solid athlete. Good striking, good movement. Uses a lot of false starts, fakes, feints, stance switching. He's a counter striker, but he's good at going forward, cutting the cage off, staying in your face, using the feints to try to open you up. Good jab, good one-two. He has a, you know, a nice uh, straight right hand lead as well. Pretty solid in and out movement. He likes to leap in with the left hook, throw a straight right to straight right to uh, left hook to the body. He will also throw very nice left hooks to the body to left hooks to the head combinations. Nice counter uppercuts and front knees. In his match with uh, Mark Madsen, he broke Madsen's jaw with the knee. And you could see in the fight with uh, Max Roshkoff, that knee was really making Rosh Max Roshkoff think twice about level changing. And he likes to throw front leg round kicks to the body. He'll mix in some spinning back fists, spinning back kicks. And um, in his last fight, though, he did do a better job of knowing who he's fighting. He's fighting a grappler. He, he used majority hands in that fight and he set it up really well with the, with the uh with the movement and the feints he can be low output he tends to wait for opponents to strike to counter and he will stand in front of opponents and uh is a little bit heavy on that lead leg he can also be hit with some overhand some straight punches and he isn't a big power hitter he only has four ko tkos in his career he's never been finished by strikes though very tough dude and he's a pretty decent wrestler himself i mean he does use a good job of uh he does do a good job of using his punches to create entries into his singles as doubles. Pretty good back takes. And when fighters pressure him, he tends to, uh, you know, be a little bit hittable and want to shoot takedowns. In this fight, obviously, he's going to want to try to keep it on the feet. His takedown defense is improving. And, um, you, you know, in his fight with Roshkoff, he showed really good single leg takedown defense. His initial takedown defense is good. He tends to get taken down by chain wrestling more often. Specifically in the clinch, he tends to give his back from standing. And his get-ups were on point, though, his last fight. He was making Max pay for the attempts with hard knees, good get-ups against the cage. And he was able to survive some bad positions to get some good guys on the mat. He defended some heel hooks in his last fight. He does have three, uh, three career submissions himself. He has been submitted one time. But in this fight, I like the experience. I like Austin Hubbard. I like the number as a bet as an underdog also. I'm just not sold on Selecki striking. This isn't Weidman, man, who's extremely easy to take down. Didn't try to stand up off bottom. Tried to attack guillotines instead of defending the takedown. He's going to be fighting a guy who's going to be pressuring, looking to strike with dangerous weapons, front knees, uppercuts. And um, when he gets taken down, he's going to be trying to get right back up. He's going to be trying to defend the takedowns and actually be much harder to take down than Weidman as well. He's going to make him work. And I just think... He's going to catch Selecki with the knee or break him down with strikes, get him tired, and finish him. Either way, 
I kind of see Hubbard getting a finish via strikes in this fight, and I like Austin Hubbard, so the pick for me is going to be Austin Hubbard to get the victory. And I'm not sure we got a female fight, and man, I mean, I know a lot of people like to shit on women's MMA, but I like this fight. I like both these girls also. I, they're fun fighters uh, to watch, you know, and uh, obviously, if you watch my channel for a while, you know that in my last fight, or the last fight that Amanda Lamos had, she was like a plus 280 underdog when she fought Miranda Granger, and uh, I actually picked Lamos in that fight. Had a lot of people, like, um, really going crazy at me for that pick. Like, oh, no way, Lamos is going to win. She's a bum. She lost to Leslie Smith, blah, blah, blah. And then now in this one, I'm watching videos, and it's like everyone's picking Lemos. So it's a little weird when you see when you see something switch like that. But for Mizuki, in a way, she's making her second UFC start. She had an impressive victory over Yunnan Wu, in my opinion. Yunnan Wu is one of the biggest 125ers in the division. She was able to get the victory, and now she's dropping down to original weight class of 115. And that fight was a split decision, but... I mean, watching it, I thought in a way 130-27, she barely got hit. I thought she dominated the fight. And um, she has some high-level experience at 115, much more than Lemos. I mean, she's fought the likes of Ayaka Hamasaki, Alex Chambers, Beck Rawlings, Karolina Kovacavich, Alexa Grasso, Virna Gianaroba. I mean, you could see the experience exuding from Mizuki in the cage. She has extreme calmness, extreme composure. She never breaks her waivers in there, and she's really improved her defense on the feet. Really good head movement. She's good at ducking and rolling punches. You could tell she's been working really hard with Ray Longo on the boxing. Nice jab. Strong one-two. She'll throw the one-two, duck and roll, then fire back with another combo. Her feints are really good. She had Yunnan Wu really biting hard on her feints. She'll go downstairs and then follow that up with left hooks to the head. Great forward pressure. She throws a lot of volume. That's going to be the battle in this fight. The volume, the forward pressure of Mizuki versus the power of Lemos. And Mizuki isn't the most athletic girl, so she could struggle with explosive athletes like Lemos, but she is going to be at a big power disadvantage in this fight as well. Watching her last fight with Yuna and Wu, though, Wu is kind of a girl that has a lot of power too, and she was able to shut that down with technique. The first two rounds, Mizuki pressured her, hit, barely got hit back. She showed great defense, just kind of dominated Wu. She's a warrior, she has a great chin, she's never been finished in her whole career. And she's a super solid grappler. Very strong in the clinch. Nice underhooks game. Good elbows. Good dirty boxing. Good takedowns in the clinch. But she really isn't an active seeker of the takedown. Her game is more pressuring girls with their boxing. Drawing out bad shots from them. And off of her back, she has a great guard. Great sweeps. Great submissions from there. And her guard is very hard to pass. She has a great arm bar. Um, in her fight with Virna Janaroba, who we all just saw last weekend... Uh, get Felice, out, Felice Herrig out of there in just under two minutes. She was actually able to control Virna inside of her guard. She shut down a lot of Virna's game, even threatened Virna with submissions. Later on in the fight, Janda Roba was even able to take her back with a lot of time to work. And Mizuki showed great defense, was never really threatened that badly. Um, she was able to turn in, eventually get on top near the end of the round. And we all know Janda Roba is a world class black belt. Mizuki has 10 submissions, 9 are arm bars. Her cardio or composure is probably the most impressive thing about her. She's not going to get tired, and that's a huge advantage for her in this fight. Amanda Lemos, she came back with a vengeance in her last fight. She returned from a long USADA suspension, came back in a new weight class as a big dog, won in resounding fashion. She took Miranda Granger's perfect record, and she submitted her in the first round. She looks like a beast at 115 pounds. It could be a factor in the division. I mean... In her fight with Leslie Smith, that was at 135. She's a big girl for this division. And actually a pretty technical, powerful striker. Solid movement. Heavy low kicks inside, outside. She makes girls panic with these kicks at times. Nice jab, good left hook. She'll walk opponents into one-twos, double straight right hands. Heavy, accurate overhand right. Fluid hands, good hand speed. She puts combinations together well. She throws with power. She's a finisher. She has a nice, heavy round and front kick to the body. She'll throw spinning heel kicks. Defensively, she leaves a lot to be desired, though. When fighters force her to trade in the pocket, she gets very wild. She doesn't move her head. She likes to lean back and leave her chin in the air. And Leslie Smith put a pace on her that she just couldn't keep up with. She backed her towards the cage, put the volume on her, and got her out of there. Lemos was visibly exhausted in the second round. And when she gets tired, she'll just back up to the fence, shell up, doesn't use a lot of movement. And um, she really struggles to fight moving backwards. 
she doesn't offer much. And when she can go forward, dictate the pace of the fight, she's a beast. I mean, she's finished five or seven wins by knockout. And she showed off grappling in her last fight. She isn't a terrible grappler. In the clinch, she's physical. She'll hit nice body locks, nice trips. She'll posture up, throw some pretty hard shots on top. And um, in her last fight, she was able to hit a rear naked choke from a weird angle with no hooks in. Choked her opponent out cold quickly. It proved she had a serious squeeze. And she's been backed up pretty easily in, in her past fights, though. She can be controlled against, in the clinch against the cage. She showed poor takedown defense and uh, in previous fights. And I haven't seen Lemos have to deal with many good wrestlers, but I have seen her hit a decent guillotine when a fighter shut in on her against the fence. And she was able to hit a deep half guard sweep, took top position in another fight I saw. But she slows down in fights, especially when fighters make her fight at a high pace. She had yet another finish in the first round in her last fight, so her cardio is still a question mark. She should have to work harder to get to 115, but it is yet to show, you know, she's yet to show that her cardio has improved because that fight was so fast. In her fight with Leslie Smith, she gassed out really badly, so it's interesting to see her get see if she gets extended past round one here. And, um, man, I mean, you have two types of fighters here. Amanda Lemos, the powerful girl. She goes in the octagon looking for knockouts. Big power. She takes a lot of goes out in the first round. Mizuki, anyway, she's defensively sound. She's technical. She's an all-rounder. But doesn't really have that power or the explosiveness. With that explosiveness, though, where usually doesn't come with it, like you just said, is the cardio. And that's the same story for Lemos. She's finished all but one of her wins in the first round. And she's 1-2 and two in fights to go past round 1. Mizuki Inoue is the total opposite. She has a motor. She has amazing composure. She doesn't stop coming forward. She never wavers. She never quits. She has, uh, you know, great defense. And um, Lemos has solid movement. And I think early on, she's really going to try to implement the low kick from the beginning as a big part of her game plan. Try to throw uh, the jab, the left hook, the low kicks, walk uh, her into one twos. And. Um, in a way, I mean, I think she's just going to be consistent, keep that pace, the forward pressure, try to make Lemos miss and tire her out. And like I said, I see Lemos striking early, having success, but the forward pressure making her slow down. Once she gets tired, I think we start to see her use more of a grappling game plan, but I think Mizuki will be wise to that, deny it, keep it standing. Even if she does take her down, I think she'll be able to sweep, submit, or get up. And as the fight continues, she's going to start to back Lemos up, land them the more numbers maybe even get some clinch control time against the cage and my pick's actually going to be mizuki in a way to win a decision and i think mizuki has potential here to you know get close to the rankings and do something in division lemos as well both these girls are good fighters here all right we're moving into the main card here first fight on the main card takashi sato d-rod daniel rodriguez and um daniel rodriguez he's looking to move to 3-0 in 2020 and in the ufc so He's been doing well so far this year. He's won eight fights in a row. And his one loss was a split decision. So he's arguably could be undefeated here. And Takashi Sato, he's looked good winning two of his first three UFC fights. And he earned a quick knockout. He won in less than a minute in his last fight. And Rodriguez, kind of a volume puncher. In his last fight, he landed 175 strikes through 345 in a three-round fight. Throws punches and bunches. Decent combinations. But he was allowing himself to get walked down in his last fight. He ate a lot of shots. He is a bit sloppy and slow. He doesn't really have the biggest power in his hands either. Takashi Sato is definitely going to be the faster, crisper, tighter puncher. He does a good job of using his jab as a range finder for the straight down the middle. Southpaw, light on his feet. He definitely has a better in and out movement and a much more one shot power. He's also a lot faster than Rodriguez. The issue with Sato is he's a bit chinny. Rodriguez is super durable. And Rodriguez has good cardio, even though he slows down a little bit. I think he has better cardio than Sato. I mean, keeps a really high uh, volume attack out. And I think he could maybe wear on Sato or maybe, you know, touch his chin and hurt him here because of the durability issue. But Rodriguez is a little weak to the body himself. Sato doesn't really target the body much, but... On the feet, I do favor Sato, especially early. I mean, he has five or nine first-round knockouts. I kind of think Rodriguez is going to try to maul Sato against the cage, have a takedown game plan, but I don't know if he could take down Sato. He's a really good judo guy. Um, if he could survive early, use that to wear him down and land shots off the break, uh, get some late takedowns, maybe he'll be able to get a decision, but I'm actually going to go the other way. I think Takashi Sato has too good a movement, too much speed. 
I didn't really like how Daniel Rodriguez looked in his last fight. He ate a lot of a lot of shots. And I just think Sato is uh, the cleaner, better striker. I think his grappling is good enough to negate Daniel Rodriguez's. So, unless he gasses out here, I actually think he's going to win. And I'm actually going to say he gets a knockout here. So, I'm going to go Daniel Rodriguez. I mean, with Takashi Sato, either first round knockout or just a knockout somewhere in the fight. Oh, shit. Here we go. We got Maria Agapova coming back and Shayna Dobson. And, man, I told you motherfuckers last time, dude. Uh, that's the reason why I wanted to interview this chick when I interviewed her on my channel. Because, man, I mean, when you watch her fight, I mean, I don't know. She just has something, man. She has that dynamism. She uh, gets in there. She goes and tries to finish chicks. And she's she's a freak, man. I mean, you see her on, uh, online. You know, she's fucking painting pictures with her own blood. She's, like, in the octagon, like, fucking prancing around like she has doesn't have a care in the world i mean she, she's training krav maga i mean man i mean it looks like what she's in there like her heart rate isn't even going up at all she's just so focused and like it's like i don't know but man i mean it's just a <laughs> this fight i mean maria called out Shayna dobson on the mic after her last fight and we know what it is i mean the line is insane i mean i see her like minus 1200 things like that i wouldn't play that i mean I do think Dobson, I mean, if we want to just talk about who's better at what, whatever, Dobson probably has better boxing, I mean, if they had a boxing match or something, because Maria's still kind of, um, you know, she uses her height a little bit, she'll lean back, she does kind of expose her chin, and if they just trade in the pocket, I mean, Dobson does have some some nice, decent boxing, but Dobson, you know, she's, she's uh, someone that mentally quits in a lot of fights. I feel like Maria is the complete opposite. She's never going to show any type of, uh, you know, quit. She's never going to even, like, want to be out there. She's in her element in there. And, um, I mean, Dobson, she gets hurt to the body in a lot of fights. Maria has disgusting body kicks, man. Front kicks up the middle. They're kind of the same height. So, like I said, if they just box, I would be a little bit worried. But Maria's going to be coming with the kicks, with the long-range attacks. Uh, she's just more durable than Shayna. She throws more numbers than Shayna. She has the better grappling. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't see a lot of ways that Shayna could win other than like a flash knockout with her hands, which is just extremely unlikely for a woman's flyweight. So... I mean, I, this is like a sacrifice, man. I think that Maria's going to come in there, going to be similar to the fight with Hannah Cyphers. I think she's going to hurt her to the body, though, and with the kick and set it to the head, potentially. Um, maybe Dobson will turn her up. She'll jump on her back, take the neck, or maybe she'll pound her out, finish her. But I think Maria's going to get a finish here, another finish. And, uh, man, I think Maria could go in there and compete with these top 15 girls already. But, you know, she's young, progress her up slow. And, man, I mean, I, I really do still believe, man, even if she lost this fight some fluke way, I just, I think Maria will be up there, man. I think she'll be in that top five at some point, maybe even be a future champ. So, definitely got Maria here. I think she's going to, you know, win this fight and uh, get a finish. <laughs> Fuck, man. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. I mean, Mike Slow Rodriguez taking on Marcin Procneo. <laughs> Fuck, man. I mean, both these guys, real low level. Mike Rodriguez, he does have one UFC win where he did get uh, Adam Milstead out of there. He knocked him out. And uh, other than that, he has three losses in the UFC. He lost to Devin Clark by decision. He's got knocked out in his last two fights. Or no, he had, he had a decision loss as well to John Allen, but it got chased to a no contest. And then he got knocked out in his last fight. I'm sorry. But for Proc Neo, he came in there. He has fought some better guys. I mean... He's fought Sam Alvey in 2018, who was in the top 15 at that point. And then he fought um, Magomed and Kalayev, who uh, I believe has the longest winning streak in lightweight right now, or light heavyweight besides John Jones. So, you know, those two guys are killers, man. But looking at this fight, I mean, both these guys are strikers. Um, Procneo, I mean, he's, he's an explosive guy. I think he's pretty athletic and... Uh, He's definitely live. I mean, I see people having a ton of faith in Mike Rodriguez. I mean, Rodriguez has the big length advantage. He probably is the sharper striker. You know, he has that flying knee that he has, the straight kicks, the straight punches up the middle. He's going to have like, um, I think, it doesn't have it listed there on topology, but I think Procteo has a 74-inch reach. So, 
pretty significant reach advantage. Um, I mean, but Prokney, if we could touch that chin, I mean, we saw Mike Rodriguez get put to sleep in his last fight. Prokney has some nice head kicks, some good front knees up the middle, some nice uh, straight punches to close that distance. And uh, Rodriguez has to be careful with them early on in the fight. But, <laughs> I mean, Prokney, when he gets hurt, he has no composure, no cardio. He his he throws a lot of naked kicks with his hands completely down. I mean, Rodriguez should knock this guy out. He should get the victory here. But, I mean, I don't want to touch this one with the 10-foot pole, man. I just don't have any faith in either guy to get it done here. So, yeah, I'm going to go with Mike Rodriguez by TKO. Man, this is a weird one, right? I mean, you wouldn't think that Alonzo Menafield would get a guy like Ovin St. Pru after he's coming off a loss to Devin Clark, but it is what it is at this point. Ovin St. Pru, he went up to heavyweight his last fight, couldn't get it done against Ben Rothwell. Had a very lackluster fight overall, a lot of running in that fight from OSP, and, uh, you know, did show that his power kind of translated to heavyweight because he was able to drop and hurt. Ben Rothlow whenever he went and it looked like when he was going he was much faster obviously had that athleticism advantage over Ben Rothwell and he hurt him a couple times it was a controversial fight where people thought he could have won because basically it was one of those fights where he's losing the whole round to Rothwell in two different rounds and he gets knocked down so I mean do you give him the win for the knockdown or do you give Big Ben the win for that work throughout the whole round and they gave it to Ben I agreed with that and, I mean, just looking at his record, I mean, three of his last performances were terrible. Nikita Krylov, he got finished in that fight. It looked really bad. I would say that's the worst performance of his UFC career. Dom Reyes looked horrible in that fight. Ben Rothwell looked horrible. Even when you look at, like, uh, Alir Latifi, you go back to 2018. Alir Latifi, Tyson Pedro, Michelle Oleksajczyk, the wins that he's winning... Uh, or the fights that he's winning, he's getting dropped. He's getting hurt in these fights as well. So, at 37, we're definitely seeing the end of the line here for for Ovin St. Pru. But does he have enough to beat a guy like Alonzo Menafield? Who, looking at his record, I mean, last last fight we saw him get extended past that you know one minute mark in the second round for the first time in his career, and just like a lot of people expected, he was extremely tired. He started to get taken down, controlled against the cage. And uh, dropped that decision to Devin Clark, even though he almost got him out of there in the first round. And that's something that everyone has to be weary about with Alonzo Menafield. I mean, the guy's extremely explosive, powerful. And uh, if you get caught sleeping in that first round, he's going to put your lights out. And you're going to be, you know, waking up looking at the lights because he, he throws super fucking hard, man. And, um, yeah, it's just... <sighs> I, I really, I don't know. I don't have a good read on this fight, so I want you people in the comments to tell me, what do you think? If you have a good read, what do you think? Why do you think OSP is going to take him down and sub his ass? Or why do you think that OSP is going to get knocked out? Because those are kind of the two things that I see. I mean, I guess OSP could win a decision as well, but I don't see this fight going all three rounds. I think both these guys are too dangerous if... Uh, Alonzo can't get him out of the first round and slows down. I don't think you could slow down and not get finished against a guy like Ovince. And uh, obviously, Ovince has to be weary about that first round. So, I mean, I think Ovid say Pru, he's not a wrestler like Devin Clark, man. I don't think he's going to come in there with that game plan to just, you know, run across the cage, shoot him on the legs immediately. And if he does, I think he'll get tired, man. I... I don't know. I'm going to go with Alonzo Menafield first round knockout. That's going to be my prediction here. I just think that he's going to be able to touch his chin, get him out of there in that first round. We've seen OSP get hurt in the first round in almost all of his recent fights. He, If he can't get the takedown, I think he's going to be in trouble, man. I think that Alonzo is just, he's just too explosive, too fast on the feet to close in that distance for uh, OSP at this point in OSP's career. And I kind of just think OSP is a little vulnerable, man. So I'm going to go with uh, Alonzo Menafield to get that first round knockout here. Not a lot of confidence in the pick. And like I said, I want you guys to write down in the comments, what do you think? you think OSP is going to take him down and sub him after he can't finish him? Or do you agree with me? You got Alonzo first round KO. And finally here we got the main event. Pedro Munoz taking on Frankie Edgar. Really, really intriguing matchup here. I mean, we have Frankie Edgar moving down to Bantamweight for the first time in his career. 38 years old. 
I mean, man, if uh, if I heard Frankie Edgar moving out of Bantamweight three, four, five years ago, I'd be like, fuck yeah, man, that's where you should have been. You're a, you're a small dude. You should go down to Bantamweight and kill it down there. But 38, he's, he's trying to make the move down there. <laughs> man, I mean, that's that's a red flag, guys. And uh, he, he has lost a lot of his recent fights. I mean, he hasn't won a fight since he beat Cub Swanson in 2018. And it's not like Cub Swanson has been doing too hot either. So, you know, that was a rematch as well. That was a fight he was probably very comfortable in that he thought he was going to win. Um, you know, it's it's tough, man. Frankie just, he hasn't looked very good. In this fight with Max Holloway, I will give him credit. I mean, he came in shape. He looked a lot better in that fight and went all five rounds with Max. But look at his fight with Brian Ortega. He's looking good in the fight. He's winning the fight. And uh, gets hit with that elbow, gets hit with that uppercut, gets put out. Um, Max Holloway kind of just put a clinic on him a little bit. And then in this fight with Korean Zombie, gets hit with a short left hook, gets wobbled. And um, yeah, I mean, it seems like guys are catching him when he's coming in early with the lead hook, man. I mean, when he's trying to close that distance, because this is going to be an interesting fight. I mean, we all know Pedro. He's, he's been down at 135. He's going to come to bang. He's going to have the cardio in his fucking tank. He never fucking slows down. He has a huge head. Amazing durability, man. I mean, this guy could eat some fucking hammers. I mean, look at his fight with with, uh, with Cody Garbrandt. I know my guy, uh, Curry Ninja, man. I know he, he saw Cody landing those huge bobs on Pedro Munoz. And Pedro is just staying right there in the pocket. So, you know Pedro could take a shot. And, and Frankie, unless he just hits the perfect shot, strike right on his chin like he did a Chad Mendez or something he's not going to be taking out Pedro so it's like do you really you really could trust Frankie to be to be mobile to use his boxing and win five rounds because look at the recent fights that Pedro's been in with these grapplers man he went in there with Aljamain Sterling and got taken down zero times he went in there with Brian Caraway, he got taken down zero times. He went in there with Brett Johns. He got taken down zero times. I mean, those guys are good grapplers, man. I mean, you can't say those guys can't wrestle. I mean, shit, I'm looking. I'm, the last time he got taken down was against Damian Stasiak in 2017. He hasn't been taken down since then. And that guillotine just makes it difficult, man. It's like... You want to you want to really put your neck in that position? You want to try to shoot on Pedro Munoz? Good luck. I mean, he's going to wrap that neck up and it negates a lot of people from shooting on him, man. And even if you take Pedro down, good luck holding that guy down, man. I mean, he has world-class jiu-jitsu. He's going to get back up to his feet and man, I mean, I just feel like at some point he's going to land a shot on Frankie that hurts him and either take about with strikes or submit him. It's just it's tough, man. It's tough to pick Frankie. He is going down to 135. Maybe he's going to come down here and you're going to see Frankie manhandle Pedro or hit him with a bomb and knock him out. And you're going to say, oh, shit, Frankie has big power for this division. I mean, but I don't think so, man. I don't think you're going to see him knocking out Pedro Munoz. Um, he's cutting 10 more, 10 more pounds off of his brain of water weight. He's 38. He's been getting rocked in a lot of fights. I mean... If you look at two of his last four fights, he'd never been finished in his career. And he got knocked out, man. He got knocked out by Brian Ortega. And he got, f not knocked out, I guess, but he got finished by Brian Ortega. And then he got finished by Korean Zombie. And that finish with Korean Zombie, man, he took a lot of punishment in that fight. He ate a lot of unnecessary shots, in my opinion. I mean, they let him survive the ground and pound. He got up and just got cleaned up, man. He got dropped again. Looked like he was hurt pretty badly, so... Man, I mean, I don't like seeing Frankie go going out like this, man. But I think Pedro Munoz is not a good matchup. I mean, it's a guy that has world-class grappling to counteract the wrestling of Frankie and that guillotine. He comes forward as great forward pressure. And he hits like a truck and he's extremely durable. So Frankie has to be perfect on the night, man. He has to be able to land, move, use that footwork. Kind of do like a, what John Dotson did to Pedro Munoz, but do you guys think Frankie is as fast as a guy like John Dotson or is durable? I mean, John Dotson's never been finished in his career. He's a former 125er, and he moves like lightning. I mean, Frankie isn't going to be doing that, I don't think. If Frankie likes to come forward, dart in, dart out. He doesn't like to just run away the whole time and uh, counter, so he's going to be giving Pedro opportunities as well. 
And I just feel like Pedro's going to bounce back, man. He's beaten a lot of really good guys in that division. And just too many question marks for Frankie, man. It's hard to pick him. I can't I can't pick him here, man. Got to go with Pedro Munoz. I think he's going to get a finish. Uh, whether it's a submission, you know, hurting him and dangling on that neck. Or TKOing him, taking him out. Um, don't see Frankie Edgar, you know, coming in here winning a five-round fight with Pedro Munoz via decision. And uh, I can't see him finishing him. So, got to go with Pedro Munoz here. And for this week, I'm not going to do a play a parlay of the week. I'm just going to do a, a play of the week. It's going to be an underdog. And the pick is going to be Austin Hubbard. Just as a straight bet, he's already plus money. I, I just think he's going to get the win there. So that's going to be the play of the week for you guys this week. The most confident pick, I'm going to say, uh, I'm just going to... I, obviously, it's it's uh, Moshka or Timur Valiev, but... Yeah, I'm just going to say Team Orvalia because the other guys, I mean, it's hard to be super, super confident in them. So my pick is going to be Team Orvalia to get the victory here or to as my most confident pick. So there you guys have it. Thanks for watching the breakdown, and uh, I'll talk to you guys next week.